Welcome back to my YouTube channel. We've got some special guests here today. We've got the creators of, the producers and the cinematographers and the creators of A Flash of Beauty, mm -hmm. parts one and two. Parts one and two. Flash now of Beauty, Bigfoot yeah. Revealed. And so we're in Forks, Washington, just so you know where we are. We were Home at of Twilight. Home of Twilight, yeah. mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. I should know about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I met these folks, so this is Mike, Jill, and Brett. And uh, I met them last July when they came out to the Palouse, mm -hmm. to Pullman in Moscow, to film the first part of the movie. Yep. I guess we call it Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Reveal. I know. No. It was part two. Excuse part two. Yep. Part two. I had seen yeah. part one just a f yeah. so yeah. so part one had already been filmed. Right. And I was really impressed with part one because I mean the cinematography was really good and it just kind of pulled you in all those witnesses. And in a lot of Bigfoot films, you know, you get the witness testimony, but there's no cinematography, you know, value to it beyond an ordinary documentary. It's just a lot of talking heads, right? Yeah. But you guys wanted to do something different with that. Is that yep. right? Yep. That's been the goal all along is to, is to do something that sticks out that people will, you know, look at and say, oh, yeah, they're, they're serious about this. Uh, we maybe we should be serious about this, you know, um, and we we just thought that it was kind of missing in the space, you know, right. And, and we've all believed in Bigfoot for forever so you know we, because it's part of the territory of living in oregon mm -hmm. absolutely yeah yeah being native you know pacific northwesterners and oregonians i guess all three of us are native oregonians um it's been it's been in the background since as long been the as background. we can re remember yeah and you've done other films before mm -hmm. this yeah yeah and so we brought our cinematic experience from our fictional films to this documentary in order right to, shoot it differently you know we wanted closer shots we wanted people talking directly to the camera so it had an emotional response to the audience to the viewer yeah we've all seen kind of grainy night footage of people out in the woods yes you know, storming around and we kind of wanted to take a different route and let the you know the stories are as fantastic as you know seeing bigfoot so it's like why don't we just dive into the story and let that you know paint the picture so yeah yeah and so what you had for me that was different was this wonderful drone footage in part one, which really, for me, creates this emotional feel of expansiveness of mm -hmm. mystery. Is that intentional or am I just sort of projecting well, that on? Brett was the drone pilot, got all these great shots. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I'm sure we use it to paint a picture and introduce, you know, where we're shooting, where the story's taking place. But um, you can... Yeah, I, it, it's, I think it's kind of a fundamental, you know, fundamental part of storytelling is a sense of place and sense of the world that you're in and establishing the world that you're in. And so uh, what a better way to do it than establishing our, our sense of place through drone shots, you know, and I, I just feel so grateful to have this technology to utilize it and be able to fly over some of these different right. areas. But, uh, you know, the, the second part of that is just to show how expansive the wilderness is. Yeah. And I think right. that people, you know, especially people that don't go out into nature very often, forget just how much wilderness is out there. Um, so it would be very easy for a large bipedal, you know, community of Sasquatch to be habitating throughout North America. And that's what you establish in the first film, mm -hmm. and you have that uh, mapping expert um, yeah, there. yeah. The Bigfoot Mapping Project. Yeah, correct. Right. Where people can go and you can see how close the sightings are, mm -hmm. not just from the BFRO sites, but you have actually a map yeah. of the yeah. whole U.S. and you can see, hey, there was one in next town, you know, yeah. over there. But it's crazy. No, we we found found them, and we live in suburban Portland, Oregon, and yeah. we found Bigfoot sightings four or five miles from our house. They mapped the BFRO site to them. Yeah. To, a, to a map that yeah. was the news and it's that is it that witness who says which is a shock to me and i'm sure anyone is, oh we've got astro in the shot here <laughs> he wants to be here. hello i mean here he is it doesn't get any cuter than this hey. this is my personal yeti yes. detector yeah. as jill said my emotional squatch animal because <laughs> after a squatch encounter we all need an esa yeah. yes, yes we do to recover yeah uh, so um I was surprised to learn that was it, he said two thirds of the United States has been unexplored physically. Mm -hmm. yep. That's huge. It's ah. massive. It's, it's massive, and I, I just don't think people realize that how big it is. 
Because yeah. a lot of people I talk to say, well, and I spoke to someone I know from Texas the other day. She says, hasn't the whole United States been explored? Yeah. Is there any space left? And you establish right sort of towards the beginning. We don't know most of the physical landmass. There's huge yeah. areas out there. Even Les Stroud said that in some of his. She says, look at these shots. Don't you think there could be something out there that we have we haven't figured out yet? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you look at Canada. You look at Canada, and all their major cities are at the southern border. You know, I mean, there's just nobody living. Look at the size of Canada, for instance, and then you right. look at Alaska on top of that. Huge, it's just huge. It's just so big. I advise people to get a window seat next time they're traveling over yeah. North America. <laughs> at least the northern. And section. these particular creatures are very good at being stealthy, mm -hmm. as we establish in part two, yeah. a flash of beauty, the paranormal Bigfoot. So even, it's not just the size of the U.S., it's even in suburban areas, they can show up and surprise people, right? Yep. Yep. They can yep. fit into many spaces. Anything many, many except part a uh, really dense urban area, right? Well, you know, we actually, uh, I spoke with someone, and you've spoken with him too, we'll keep him anonymous, but he, a gentleman who lives in the Midwest, and he talks about, he's like, you know, I'm in like an urban, like a city area, and they're using the greenways, mm. traveling at night. They're mm -hmm. like their own highways. He's like, they're everywhere. And Rich Germo said as much too. These sightings and interactions, they're not rare. It's a lot more common than people realize. Yeah. It's more common and it's underreported yes. by it's, a long exactly. shot. It, it, yeah, there's it, still a stigma yeah. attached to it, I think. There's, and that's yeah. part of what we try to do with the movie is, you know, make it okay to talk about this stuff. Right. Yeah. And that's really what you did in part one. You have a lot of witnesses and you establish sort of the case. Look, these these creatures exist. Here are some of the witnesses. Yeah. Right. yeah. You had a lot of good cases. What did you want to do in part two? What did you feel was left to be done from the first movie? Part two is, is all about the strangeness and the strange things that people encounter during Bigfoot sightings. And it's not true with every single sighting, obviously. You know, a lot of sightings are crossing the road and... And they last for five seconds, maybe at the most. Mm -hmm. But um, more, some of the more extended experiences, and when I say extended experiences, I'm talking about experiences that last longer than about a minute or two. Then they and start- And ongoing. And ongoing, yeah, yeah. Because it seems like there's subsequent experiences after the initial experience, and which is part of, I guess you could say it's kind of part of the paranormal phenomena. It's almost like somebody is marked. It's almost like um, they have now been, um, indoctrinated into the world of the Squatch, you know, and so they keep having these sightings and experiences. And so eventually these individuals have these things that they just can't explain, you know, um, orbs and disappearances and um, infrasound where they feel stunned. Um, so it's, yeah, it's weird. And, and we can't throw that data out. We can't ignore it. You know, that's right. a disservice to the phenomena, to the creature. And to ourselves as humans to have that understanding. Well, and to the people who've experienced and like seen the orbs, seen seen lights, or had the telepathy and a whole host of uh, things that fall outside of a flesh and blood encounter. Right. It's uh, it's doing them justice as well to let yeah. them know that they're being heard yes. and what they thought was crazy and they don't want to talk about a lot of other people experiencing and as we get into in the sequel maybe it's not so crazy it's just science we don't fully understand yes and you sir are attempting <laughs> to help us understand that science oh well thanks the guy we had thank you here. so i did film with them as we mentioned in july we did had a great day together yeah. out there on the palouse in a yeah. variety of of locations yeah mm -hmm. including on moscow mountain where there have been sightings nearby over the years, if you do your research, yeah. not all that far away. Yeah. And so in part two, you're basically saying your secret's safe with us. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. us, and you, without giving too much away, and I guess I'm privy, I saw the screening uh, yesterday. Yeah. So we don't want to give too much away, but you have a lot, and I would say very interesting cases that defy the ordinary flesh and blood explanation. Yeah. Because for years we've been hearing from the Bigfoot researchers, we want to be the scientists here, we want the data, but what data are they looking at? Right. Exactly. They're looking at the data that fits into their narrative. But their narrative, exactly. And backs exactly. up yep. their story and their beliefs yep. and their foundation. So footprints, handprints, and 
Powell's, which was all very interesting, no, right. no doubt about it. And yeah. we had a great panel discussion this morning. Yeah. And those people that did that in the 70s and 80s, sort of, for them, that was a huge risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were mentioning Grover Krantz. For him even to come out, I heard his niece talk recently, Laura mm -hmm. Krantz. Oh, wow. Mm. She works for NPR. Oh, wow. really? And oh. she said, I recently discovered that uh -huh. my uncle was one of those crazy Bigfoot guys. <laughs> and I wanted to find out for myself oh, wow. how crazy he was. And then I started investigating mm -hmm. and they found that he, he actually was considered a very legitimate character. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think she wrote a book. Yeah. You know. So this is the stigma we're dealing with, isn't it? Even just going from hard evidence, footprints, and, and recordings of sounds. But yeah. what people experience is a little more than that, isn't it's a, it? People it's a get, lot more than that. It becomes personal. I mean, people get into gifting relationships, and these mm -hmm. gifts go back and forth, and the it gifting, becomes personal. Yes. You know, we like Daryl Adams, you know, his wife was going through some heart, dis um, heart issues. Right. And so, you know, what shows up is, you know, heart-shaped rocks or, you know, it's something yeah. that has, you know, some, it's a sentient person and it has emotions and it's, yeah. you know, it's-, it's So this challenges that. our cultural beliefs I think so. about we're the ones that are the only sentient species. Right. Conscious, sentient, thinking. We, this story we've been told ever since we were two days old. Yeah. Is well, it, it scares people. It, it scares and people are, are rightfully so. It scares people. The unknown scares people. It, which I completely understand. And some of that comes from a, a, a religious backdrop. Yeah. You know, and we talk about that in the, in the sequel, but we don't think that this is a nefarious situation. We, we feel like, you know, just, you know, you go back 100, 200, 500,000 years, whatever it is, cultures around the world were afraid of things they didn't understand. It's common for humans to be afraid of things they don't understand. And we're coming out and saying, okay, let's try and understand this. Let's first first acknowledge that this is science, this isn't witchcraft, this isn't demonology, this isn't something that is going to, you know, come and get you, and, and Bigfoot doesn't want to eat you, you know. So, um, and the other point that I want to make about this, too, is a lot of people say, well, there's no physical evidence, and rarely is there physical evidence, but the one thing that, that we found, and unfortunately we don't have anything like this in, in either documentary, is that these individuals have experienced trauma, and we show that facet of it you show the trauma of it but you can take a brain scan and you can see the trauma on the brain you can actually see a bruise on the brain it's a physical scar if you will i think even medical science will call it a scar from that trauma or that post-traumatic stress syndrome many of these individuals have that you know um in retrospect i would have loved to have got gone deeper down that um but it's true you know and this is this is this is definitely the case for a lot of these folks. And, and so there's many people out there that um, I heard a story here at this Bigfoot conference about somebody who was a doctor who um, his wife's car was practically destroyed, you know, um, and that's that's part of it. That's part of the, the trauma. And, the, and he said, I can never speak of this again. I can't tell anybody publicly. Right. I don't want to talk right. about it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. These so, are the stories we don't hear very much about because it's almost like the deeper the trauma, the less likely oh, we yeah. are to hear about the story. Yeah. Right. But that's yeah. all the more reason we need to hear it so people mm -hmm. are prepared when they go out to wild areas. Yeah. yeah. You could literally encounter something, right, that the National Forest Service or the National Park didn't tell you about. Right. And, 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 and they're not going to. These people yeah. are saying, I never want to hike again. I yeah. never want to go camping again. Yeah. I'm never going out in the woods again. Yeah. This is what we hear. I've heard this over and over yeah. again. Yeah. And so you can understand why the, the, the national parks and the forest service would want to keep it quiet. Because think of the impact that would have on my <laughs> on finances. Do you need a puppy in your life? I think, I think so. I got one. Yeah. So, so the, that's the thing about it is it's not all traumatic. On the other mm -hmm. flip side, people have this sense of wonder and astonishment they get telepathic communication yes right yeah the gifting the relation gifting. i know people who've had this experience this too they were yeah. absolutely amazed at some worst moment something showed up just that they needed yeah at right. the right time right. they can't understand yeah. in the middle of nowhere how this perfect object showed up mm -hmm. just what they needed and that is be i think it's very challenging for our culture to accept that there's some other sentient or even more advanced creature than us that's around that knows a lot more about us than we know about them some of these gifts are more personal than like what a husband's going to give a wife on their 25th wedding very personal i mean it is like eerie personal eerie personal eerie personal um but it's but at the same time it's not like 
scary. It's not a bloody knife, you know. I mean, it's like no. these. It's like you know, it's an example in our heart. film. Yeah, it's from the heart. It's like an example from our film when you know this individual, Tobe Johnson, was talking about how he lost his cell phone. Yeah. And the next day, there's a cell phone. It's muddy. It's dirty. It was obviously found by someone and kept. And they knew and they understood it and they left it for him. And it's a, a lot of these things, like the heart that was left for Daryl Adams' wife, the, they're the, very the personal, bruises, they're very the, touching. The cats and then these little yeah. cats. Yeah. yeah, it's very touching. It's very it's touching and much. very mysterious. <laughs> so, one final comment I guess I should make as someone who's, who's in the film. We want to challenge science, and we want science at the same time. We're not saying throw science out, no, but yeah. we're saying this is actually part of what science has been telling us, yes. that we haven't, we haven't had a discussion about Sasquatch in our country, but we also haven't had a discussion about a lot of the technology and science that's been under development ever since Nikola Tesla and before. Yeah. Yeah. And we could yeah. all agree that is something that we'd like to talk about. We're having discussions about UFOs in Congress right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Hi. That looks like it hurts, Jill. You okay? <laughs> He's... I'm okay. Hey, pal. <laughs> so, we're, we're well, having too much fun, I think. So this is another point, is that science needs to expand its definition of what it is to in include these phenomena, right? You, and yeah. not just toss it out, oh, this is paranormal, we don't do that, we're just sticking to flesh and blood, yeah, just you... howls and footprints only. Well, We don't want to hear about orbs, we don't want to hear about mind speak. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you can't ignore it. You I can't mean, ignore it. It's out there. And, and, yeah. and I think part of the dialogue needs to be this. We need to, we need to look out there into the, the, the vast, you know, economic wilderness of the United States or the world or North yeah. America or whatever. And we need to challenge some folks out there that have the capacity to be a benefactor and be willing to put up some money to help those folks that are afraid of the ridicule in academia, yes. that have the intelligence, that have the tools that can go out and help solve this problem. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Do not eat your, my sunglasses, please. Um, I think Astro really wants to be in this. I think he I wants to be in the movies. Simeon, I am the worst puppy baby. You were supposed to be the puppy minder here. So the, the thing I want to say about that, this is the same discussion the U.S. had about child abuse in the 1960s, mm -hmm. as I think I mentioned to you before. It's something that sociologists know about, and, yeah. and it wasn't accepted until groups of people got together, a couple of meetings in Chicago and D.C., and there were a couple figures that we have to recognize. They brought law enforcement and pediatricians and therapists together, and they agreed it's really happening. And yeah. The radio guys, this is not kids falling out of trees. This is not kids with thin bone structure. There's, yeah. There are actually events happening that they're being abused. And so we're saying something similar, bro. I mean, this is experiences yep. people are having. Yes. And, and we need to have a national discussion about it so people either can not feel the stigma Mm -hmm. Or they can get over the trauma they've had. Yeah. I haven't encountered the Sasquatch myself, but I don't know what would happen. I mentioned a case today of a friend in Arizona, mm -hmm. and she said she just started walking again in trails, oh, really? not even woods, desert. Wow. She was too afraid to go outside. Wow. Well, wow. Yeah. Because they're that big. Yeah. And they have an intensity to them. Oh, yeah. And we've never been trained how to deal with this, yeah. right? Right. Yep. So, yep. when can we expect to see the film, folks? So we're recording this in the, right at the end of May, Memorial Day. Memorial Day. How long do we have to wait? I've seen it, and I can say it's fantastic. So yes. see it as soon as you can. We are tracking for this fall. I'm saying October, and I'm having the strangest deja vu. I swear really? we've done this before. So Please don't. I'm not surprised. Right I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's one of these yeah. space yeah. time shifts that we talk mm -hmm. about in the film. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to say, folks, there's some cases in there that are going to knock your socks off that I've never seen. I've heard sort of things, but we have the evidence in this of cases that you are wanna gonna know about. I mean, you're gonna wanna see yeah. these. So yeah. this is go out as soon as you can see this, you're gonna wanna rent this or buy this and to see these cases where we document these types of phenomena that we've mm -hmm. called paranormal, whatever they are. Yeah. yeah. They're extremely strange and they extremely don't fit strange. any ideas that we've talked about very much. Nope. No, no, no. Well, yeah. Yeah. Check it out when you get a chance before it disappears. No, I'm kidding. It's not going anywhere. Before it gets censored and de yeah. deleted from, yeah. Yeah, from exactly. the algorithm, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's if, a too controversial. And mark my words, if anything ever happens to us, you heard it here first. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, guys. Well, listen, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks Thank for you. coming over to Forks, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Thanks. thanks.